Um, is everybody back at school? Yeah. Everybody happy? No. Sorry. No, school. No. All right, today I'm going to tell you a fairy tale. Ready for this? <clears throat> Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Goldilocks. One day, she went for a walk in a dark, dark wood. Soon, she came to a pretty cottage. Well, actually, it was more of a cave. Well, no, it wasn't really a cave. It was kind of a narrow tunnel dug into the ground, and it led to a muddy underground den. So Goldilocks knocked on the mouth of the tunnel, and nobody answered. So she crawled down into the den. And at the table in the den, she found three bowls of porridge. Let's be accurate. There was no table, because there was no kitchen, because bears don't have the fine motor skills to build kitchen units or, or furniture. That's why you never see a bear loading a dishwasher or playing chess. And as for bowls of porridge, that would be completely untrue, because bears don't like porridge. And besides, they can't cook. In fact, what Goldilocks found were three rotting, dead rabbits. <clears throat> but she was very hungry, so she tasted the first one. This rabbit is disgusting, she said. She tasted the second rabbit. This rabbit is also disgusting, she said. And she tasted the third rabbit. This is the most disgusting rabbit of all, she said and decided to eat the cheese sandwich that she brought with her, which tasted very nice. After eating her sandwich, she felt really sleepy, so she went and lay down in the first bed, although it wasn't really a bed. It was more like a pile of leaves with mud and mixed with bare excrement. She lay down in the second bed, which was pretty much the same, quite uncomfortable, really, and it was also muddy with bare excrement. And finally, she lay down in the third bed, and she fell fast asleep. While she was sleeping, the three bears came home, and they crawled down the tunnel and into the den. Growl, growled the papa bear, who weighed 200 kilos and had 10 centimeter razor sharp claws. He did not say, someone's been eating my porridge, because of of course, bears can only speak bear. Growl, growled the mama bear, who weighed 150 kilos and had teeth capable of ripping human flesh to shreds. Growl, growled the baby bear, who was less dangerous, but both parents were genetically programmed to defend the baby bear to the death. Just then, Goldilocks woke up and saw the three bears. Help, she screamed but it was too late. They ate her. The end. <laughs> exactly. Now, there are many people who believe that this is the proper way to tell a fairy tale with facts, because facts are true, and a fact-based education will, particularly according to the British government, be far more useful at helping students to get jobs once they've graduated from university. Richard Dawkins, who's the world-famous atheist and author of The God Delusion, announced a few years ago that most fairy tales do not stand up to scientific scrutiny. Now, I suppose Richard Dawkins was referring to the fact that it is scientifically impossible to spin straw into gold, for giants to live at the top of beanstalks, and for frogs to turn into princes. And it is true that in repeated clinical trials, no scientist has ever managed to turn a pumpkin into a golden carriage. I'm sure you're as shocked by this news as I am. <laughs> Fairy tales are dangerous, Dawkins believes. Parents, he says, should be fostering in children a spirit of skepticism instead of filling their heads with fantasy. Children's fantasies are dangerous, in other words. Richard Dawkins and the British government are in philosophical agreement. Creativity, culture, and the arts are being systematically removed from our education system. 
In recent years, there's been a huge decline in students studying, in the number of students studying design, drama, music, painting, and sculpture. Students in Britain are being discouraged even from studying literature in favor of sciences, economics, and mathematics. The better to prepare them for serious careers like business, law, banking, and finance. Real careers where you make real money. A government education paper encouraging more students to study <coughs> economics and engineering reads, think of the impact on productivity and competitiveness. But what if productivity and competitiveness are not what you care about? What if you care about improving society? Or doing something with a goal is not to have a bigger house or a bigger car or a more expensive holiday? Is it possible that what the government tells us could be wrong? Well, it's certainly half wrong. And of course, there's nothing wrong with studying mathematics and science. But the arts are just as important. My daughter is studying physics, a subject she loves, but when she compares herself to the geniuses on her course, she gets really depressed. I'll never be as smart as they are, she says. And we know that's probably true, because her course is full of really strange geniuses who mutter in the corners of libraries and they can kind of barely speak in coherent sentences. In fact, I don't know if you get the TV program, The Big Bang Theory here, but she says that her course is just like The Big Bang Theory, only not as funny. <laughs> now, these guys are the ones who are much more likely to discover that the universe is really just a huge computer game simulation. But my daughter has an advantage. She reads books. She likes plays and music and fairy tales and TV, of course. She thinks about plot and character and story arcs and what connects the beginning of a story with the end. She knows about unexpected plot twists and surprise endings. And reading books has taught her about imagination and lateral thinking. All this will make her a better scientist because you need imagination to be a great scientist just as you need imagination to be a great writer. People forget this. They think creativity belongs to writers and artists. And you can't make much money being a writer unless you're J.K. Rowling or Stig Larsson, who's dead, so it doesn't matter. So you'd really better go off and be a banker. But imagination and the ability to tell a story will make anyone better at anything. With a great imagination, you'll be a wiser parent, a smarter lawyer, a more compassionate doctor, a better physicist, a wiser teacher, a kinder friend. As Albert Einstein said, if you want your children to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. Now, for a long time, I really wondered what Einstein meant by this. I think he meant that even if you're trying to figure out the origins of the universe, even the most deep, complex, difficult problems in the scientific world, you're basically telling a story. Here's the story that scientists tell. Seven billion improbably designed creatures living on a ball made of iron, rocks, and silicates floating in the middle of an infinite, unimaginable nothingness. And I think, really? Is there a more unlikely story than that? We accept this idea without blinking and then we worry about a bunch of bears eating porridge. Most scientific explanations for the creation of the universe are stories so weird, you'd have to be a master of science fiction to think them up. One begins with a huge explosion, which creates a universe that expands and expands and expands for billions of years, until one day it loses momentum and starts to collapse in on itself until the entire mass of everything in existence condenses to the size of a raisin. Really? Richard Dawkins thinks that the whole idea of Adam and Eve with a snake in the Garden of Eden is absurd. But what sane person would believe the real story? At the start of every amazing story, whether it's literary or scientific, there's always a person with the imagination to ask a good question. A physicist might ask, 
What makes up all the empty space in the universe? A geneticist might ask, is there a different way to cure cancer? A science fiction writer might ask, is there life similar to ours in another galaxy? You might ask, will anybody ever want to have sex with me? Or what do rabbits think about? Or how can I live in a world where Donald Trump is president? That's my big question. Everyone here today is asking questions because the job of every individual is not to make tons of money, it's to gain knowledge, to try to understand ourselves and the world, to take the facts and make connections, to try to imagine what might be as well as what is. Our job is to think about the universe, about the planet, how to live on it without destroying it, to think about why we live and how we die, why we fall in love with one person and not another person, why there's war, why some people are black and some white, why some people are rich and some poor. Our job is to reimagine the past and the future of the human race, to examine all the complicated, frightening, or hopeful possibilities in history, and in space, and here in the space inside our heads. One of the best ways to start asking and thinking up question, answers to questions like who am I and what can I do in the world is to read books. Now, of course, I would say that because I'm a writer. We'll do anything to sell books. But in my lifetime, I've lived thousands of different lives. I've lived on other continents and on other planets. I've been a champion runner, a scientist, a stand-up comedian. I've survived a concentration camp and fought in terrible wars for the British Empire. I've dropped bombs in Vietnam. I've traveled across, across the Pacific on a raft and advised King Henry VIII not to marry again. I've fallen in love with a thousand different people, lived inside the head of a man, a horse, a vampire, a king, and an ant. I've climbed Mount Everest, lived in China, California, Brazil, France, Germany, Russia, and 10,000 other places. I know what it feels like to be someone other than a middle-class, middle-aged American, suburban-born person who now lives a somewhat ordinary life in London. Most of this I've learned by reading books. Imagine a person who never reads books. Maybe a person like the President of the United States. <laughs> what might that do to your brain? Never to be anyone other than yourself in your own here and now. To be a person who knows nothing about history or how it feels to be black or poor or homosexual, a refugee, a Muslim, a North Korean, a woman, a soldier, who knows nothing about how it feels to be someone else. Without stories, we're trapped in a static version of ourselves. Stories give us choices. In 2013, a 16-year-old girl stood up at a book festival I was at and said that she appreciated how teen novels were helping to change the way gender and sex were perceived in her school. There was less bullying, she said, more acceptance of people who were different. Since 2013, it seems as if nearly our entire idea of gender and sex has changed. What used to be considered strange and unnatural has become understood and acceptable, at least for most of us. Everyone sitting here today has begun to write his or her life story. Every day you write another chapter. Some days there's way too much plot and you'd like to show, really slow down and shut the book for a while. Other times the story of your life seems impossibly boring. The hero will never fall in love or figure out what they want to do with their lives or figure out how to be a person. If you get stuck in your own story, sometimes it's useful to read someone else's. You can read about other lives, about heroes and villains and explorers and rebels. You can read about soldiers and lovers and kings, slaves and masters. You can look for ideas in what you read. You can look for themes that make you think, that expand your idea of what the world could be, of what you could be. Don't accept the idea that you have to be this sort of person or make this much money or accept this society the way it is. I wake up most days thinking that the world is a mess. I worry about climate change and refugees and World War III. I worry about Donald Trump 
and Brexit and sexual slavery and children dying of starvation. On those days, I try to remember one of my favorite lines from all the books I've ever read. It comes from T.H. White's book, The Sword in the Stone, and it's the magician Merlin talking to the young King Arthur. The best thing for being sad, he says, is to learn something. That's the only thing that never fails. You may grow old and trembling. You may lie awake at night listening to the disorder of your veins. You may miss your only love. You may see the world about you devastated by evil lunatics or know your honor trampled in the sewers of baser minds. There is only one thing for it then, to learn. That is the only thing which the mind can never exhaust, never be tortured by, never fear or distrust, and never dream of regretting. Learning is the only thing for you. Look what a lot of things there are to learn. So learn something. Try on different identities. Embrace what is difficult. Have the courage to be odd, unruly, full of ideas, ahead of your time. Be stubborn, be contrary, be different. Have enormous, earth-shattering ideas. Don't worry if they're wrong. As the great Irish playwright Samuel Beckett said, and this is my favorite quote of all time, fail again, uh, fail, fail again, fail better. Your job is to use your imagination to write the story of who you are and who you might be and make it the best story you can possibly write. In my story, Goldilocks turns on the three snarling bears and despite their huge claws and sharp teeth, they don't eat her. She and the baby bear become friends. They run away together and a few years later they become lovers. It turns out the bear's name is Eduardo. Goldilocks and Eduardo have a long and satisfying relationship during which she con convinces the bears that perhaps they could live somewhere not quite so muddy. Eventually, Goldilocks and Eduardo have a baby. They name her Estelle, which means star. This baby, half human, half bear, grows up so wise and strong and fierce and brave that she becomes president of the United States of Earth and governs wisely over a happy and peaceful world for many, many years to come. That's my fairy tale. Now go write yours. <laughs>